All right, hello everyone. I am Dr. Mary Cowan, and I have had the privilege of meeting Mr. Silverman through LinkedIn. Him and I have had some general conversations, and like the majority of my webinars, I've had this conversation and I wanna be able to share it with all of you. So I'm gonna give a brief outline and the objectives of what we're going to talk about today. So what we really want to do for you today is we want to explore a leadership pathway approach. We um, had talked about this and I think it's a really great thing um, just to explore that, how it works, what are the key components of it. We wanna expand the knowledge base on supervisory techniques, um, how that progression might look like as you build pathways for people, really want to probably focus that down into a leader member exchange type of leadership lens. We're going to talk about systematic approaches. How do you take someone through this? If you have an employee that you want to, you see the potential, you see the strength, you're like, hey, I want to take this person aside. I really want to grow them. How do you do that? What does that approach look like? And then maybe some possible disruptions. What are some things that are going to trip you up along the way? Um, so I will go ahead. Um, um, I'll let, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. You have a, an impressive history. I don't know if I could do it justice. So Thank you. I'll let Thank you. go ahead and kind of um, give your career um, introductory and then we'll just do a few introductory questions after that. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Mary for giving me the opportunity to share my knowledge and experience with everybody. Um, I've been an x-ray tech back in 1972, originally from New York. Worked at Beth Israel Hospital for about 12 years. Moved down to Florida. Uh, and shortly thereafter became a radiology director in a hospital called St. Francis Hospital, Miami Beach. It was my first true leadership experience. And from there, was able to translate uh, different opportunities to different hospitals in South Florida. Did a lot of things in my career, still in my career. Um, ran some outpatient centers. Uh, now I'm basically doing consulting work. And what I mean by consulting work, I do leasing and financing. I do consulting work for a radiology company for teleradiology services. I'm um, associated with a billing company and just signed an agreement with a company that sells uh, radiology equipment. So I've got a vast uh, uh, overview of, of in the industry. I've seen pretty much all of it in an outpatient setting, hospital setting, um, had a lot of challenges through my career and uh, was, I think, being able to overcome them most. Mostly. I'm sure you did. Um, well, thank you. Like I said, thank you for sharing your, your knowledge and everything you've learned all along the way because I've I've definitely learned that. Um, struggles have helped me out and made sure that I've kind of taken something away from that experience. So anytime that anyone else can have the experience and then I can learn from it, I'm in. <laughs> so I don't have Absolutely. to go there and do that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I just have a few introductory questions that I normally ask my participants. It's fun, it's fun for me to get to know you. It's fun for our audience to get to know you. Um, so one of them is, what did you want to be when you grew up? Like I didn't, when I was seven years old, I didn't even know radiology existed it wasn't anything like that so what, what what were your aspirations as a little kid so i was a rare rare breed in high school and just not academically uh the best but very practical sense uh came from a very structured family and i was into sports a lot i, I decided maybe i should become a baseball player because i love sports still love it i was playing up until a couple of years ago and then i started to realized, let me look at something. I, I'd like to help people. I want to help people. I volunteered at a short period of time in a hospital just to observe what was going on. Would I? Would it be a good fit? And I spoke to a, a student that was in the program at the time, Brooklyn Jewish Hospital. Uh, it was a private hospital school, uh, accepted only 10 students. And I told my parents, this is what I think I want to do right out of high school. And they said I was crazy. This is not good for you. Uh, you don't know what you're doing. You need to pursue something else. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I always cherished what my parents had to say and decided, you know what, I'm going to try this. And so I applied to the school, was accepted uh, tentatively by the school because at that age, I was 18 years old. Uh, mm -hmm. Only one, one of 10 people were accepted to the school. And wow. I made a commitment to myself that I was going to make it in this program, even though I was dealing with older folks. Uh, difficult experiences. I have a passion to help people. And so I went into the program, did very well, uh, passed the grades really well. A lot of my peers 
were better academically, they had gone to college. But when it came to being practical and had a good attitude and working hard, I excelled. I graduated, um, got a job prior even to me graduating. Uh, one of my administrators at the time saw the potential in me, uh, mm -hmm. became an x-ray tech at Beth Israel Hospital, and gradually started moving up the, lane, the, the chain of, uh, of management. And uh, I love the challenges. I love the passion of it. And I love to work with people. Sounds great. And I don't regret I, anything that I've done along the way. Well, that's great. I seem to hear that repeatedly as I talk to more and more people and as I host, um, you know, numerous webinars. That it's, it sounds like everyone's like, I decided to do this. I went after it. I did it, and I got it done. So I'm, I applaud that type of mentality. I um, I went to college my first year on a golf scholarship, and that's basically what I did. My um, my father had to call me on Wednesday and say, Mary, you get a job and a major by Friday. I'm cutting you off. You got to decide what you want to do. So <laughs> a lot of people like that that knew that right out the gate. So I, I love that. Um, how about your first boss? Um, did you learn something from them? Is this where you sparked this kind of this passion and creativity for Pathways? Or what was that experience like? So my first boss, and being a rookie in the field, um, I had to be a follower. I, I couldn't make any comments. Uh, I'm, you know, Typically, uh, I was very introverted at the time. And I was a team player, and I saw my boss come into work every day. It was very frustrating. Uh, she would come into work, uh, not engage with the staff, make decisions within the department. We had a very big department. We had 200 people in the department. A lot of issues, uh, but she decided to make her choices by herself without engaging the staff. And I was very frustrated because I saw there were opportunities as a technologist to improve things if they would only ask. And sometimes I would be bold enough to say, hey, listen, you know, Nicole, you may want to try it this way. You know, being an x-ray tech, I see, see, I see things differently than as a chief tech. In those days, they called them chief techs, not okay. administrators. So I, I, I try to intervene a little bit, knowing that, you know, hey, listen, I just started this. I, I really don't know a lot like she does. She was very knowledgeable, very personable. But it was very frustrating to me and the staff to see that nobody looked at us as staff members, it's what we thought. And I, I made a commitment to myself, if I ever got an opportunity to be in leadership, I would be engaging to the staff, uh, empower them, let them make decisions and create a team approach. And so that's what I basically uh, decided to do once I became in leadership. Uh, and for me, it worked and for the staff. Great. So that's kind of what drove you in the direction of, of seeking that pathway and making sure that you had that, that level of shared governance. I think I see that a lot. I think also as leaders, it seems to me per our discussion, you did a really great job of not just asking because people get asked a lot. I can ask you all day what you think, what you want, what, but if I don't do anything with the information or I don't give you an answer to it, um, I think sometimes as leaders we're it's difficult for us to tell people no, or to tell them that, you know, that's not logistical, that's not gonna work for us. Um, so what techniques did you use as far as creating that approach? Since you knew that you had this passion to create that approach, did you use special um, instruments? Um, did you find anything specifically handy in trying to do this for people? The biggest tool I used was communication. Okay. You've got to communicate. Without communication, all and everything else fails. Uh, you've got to gain the respect of your coworkers and peers, uh, and they have to trust in you to, to believe that what you're doing and saying is really true, and it's a buy-in. Uh, you know, my approach is, as when I became a director, my philosophy was, I'm not their boss. I just provide the resources for them to do their job well. Hmm. And using that type of philosophy seemed to have helped, because without engaging your staff and doing certain things like cross-training, uh, education, communication, uh, the staff is not going to uh, respond to you very favorably. Okay. Um, so did you do that necessarily? Did you bring people in one-on-one? -on -one? Did you have team meetings? Um, you know, and what kind of environment did you do that? What what worked best to create that? So anytime I took a new position, and, and often and, and several times I got promoted from within. So I knew the, the people that I was dealing with. However, when you're in management, you You've got to draw that line. You can't be on the same side of your staff when you were friends and socializing and so on. It doesn't work. You have to separate yourself, be professional. And so basically what I did is I let them know what my goals and objectives were very clearly. 
Uh, I sat each individual down, had a 15 minute meeting with each person, okay. wanted to understand what who they were, what they were looking for, and give them an insight of what I was about so that they understand who they are dealing with as a new boss. It's always frightening to see, uh oh, what's he gonna do? Is he gonna get rid of me? Is he gonna do this? And I wanted to assure them that I work for them. They do not work for me. The unknown uh, is scary and, though, yeah. And I want them to be comfortable with me, that I'm not a threat. Uh, I'm for them. I'm one of them in a the sense that I was an x-ray technologist. I went through the, the pain and suffering that everybody else does. <laughs> but this time, my style is different than most. They're going to have a choice. They're going to be empowered. They're going to make sure that they make some decisions that maybe they weren't able to do in the past. And you have to have them buy in. Yeah. One thing I wouldn't tolerate is the what I call dead wood, the people with the bad attitudes. Uh, you know, too often what we do is we spend so much time on the negative employees and not enough time on the positive employees. And so I decided to change that around. I was looking to uh, in, initiate the good employees, promote them, cross-train them, educate them, and eventually the bad employees would eventually jump off ship, if you will, because they wouldn't be part of that team. And, and I encouraged that. I didn't want anybody who didn't want to be there and give 100% to working in my department. It was toxic. And when you have toxicity in your department, it creates bad morale. Bad, bad morale reduces your product productivity. Uh, people love to change jobs. And I didn't want that. I wanted to have a very nice environment. We could all work for the same goal and objectives. And um, that was my style. Okay. So you did, you found that eventually that, what do you call it, Deadwood? Deadwood, basically, they would, if you just kept engaging um, the, you know, the, the top level performers or even um, that, that, that Deadwood kind of drop off, like once they were. Eventually, weren't because, you know, there were some troublemakers in every environment that don't want to comply yeah. with rules, policies, procedures, and you, you've got to be consistent with your decisions based on policy, procedures, protocols from the organization. And, you know, eventually, if they don't buy in, they have two choices. They can either leave or I'll get rid of them. I didn't hesitate. Listen, I, I don't like to fire anybody with the most difficult part of, of a job to sure. ask somebody to leave, but uh, they had choices and they're adults. And if they're not going to be part of the team, then maybe they need to go elsewhere. Okay. And I wanted to promote the good employees uh, by, you know, giving them encouragement. Recognition is the number one thing, I think, to an employee to keep good employees. You have to recognize them in a positive way. You can't keep telling them what they're not doing right, what they're not doing correctly. You've got to stroke them. You've got to encourage them, acknowledge them in front of their peers, in front of staff meetings. Uh, I often, uh, in my staff meetings, would announce, you know, a really great uh opportunity that another employee did uh give them um, a recognition of the month an employee of the month if you will okay so we acknowledge them uh and we also provided lunch for that employee or employees we had a little committee uh, my supervisors would would join in and have we'd have a committee because it's got to be a buy-in by everybody and yeah. we would uh, uh decide based on criteria who they thought the employee of the month would be and it, all we would do is recognize employees pay attention to the good employees, not worry about the bad employees. Often they would come in to come into my office and complain and complain and complain. And I would push the hot potato back into let their lap and say, okay, come up with a solution. Let's find a way to solve this. I don't have the answers to everything, no. but I rely on the people around me to help me make those decisions. And if they're not willing to come up with any legitimate suggestions or show improvement, then I knew they were just there to cause trouble. And eventually everybody else caught on. And that's, a, that's a good way to do that. Um, how about the mid-level performers? That's something that I struggle with. I'd love to get your opinion on that. Like, uh, you know, I often see people that I see a ton of potential in and I really want to, you know, create that pathway or I see kind of those those troublemakers. But what about the middle of the road people that they come to work, they do their job, um, they're not, they don't, you don't really pursue the outstanding margin, but they're not really on the lower end margin. What do you do with a mid-level performer in that situation? Well, I would try to incentivize them. What I mean by that is have a little talk with them. I mean, okay. calling them in the office one-on-one, -on -one, closing the door, let them just vent what their what their option, what, what options they have and give them what options they have. You know, listen, I see you're doing really well in radiology. Would you ever think about being a CT tech? Did you ever think about being a specialist procedure tech? 
let me show you what that means. And so what I would often do with my staff, which was a really good technique to do, I found, let me let you walk into their shoes. I would have them for a week, stay in CT, observe what they do, go into MRI, observe what they do, go into special procedures, put that lead apron on for eight hours, let them see what the special procedure tech does, working closely with the radiologist, the nursing, and see if they get a taste for that. Because often they don't realize what the other person does in their environment. And that includes CT, MRI, ultrasound, nuclear medicine. Very rarely do they expose themselves to that environment. They don't know what the nuclear medicine tech does. Maybe they'd have an interest in that. Let them share the experiences with each other. It's called walking your shoes. So we would do that with everybody for about a week. It was painful because you had to get procedures done and, and deadlines mm -hmm. done, but you know what? It was worth the investment because long-term wise, it was gonna make a good uh, payback. And you start to stroke your employee and give them encouragement, push them. It's not only monetary reasons why, it's an education, it's pursuing your future. I've had a lot of CT techs that left me, decided to go to sales. Monetarily, they were making very good money. They didn't have to put up with the moaning of the patients and the, 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 the ICU patients. And so they found a new niche and they moved on to a different and better environment. And so I'm always trying to encourage them, don't stagnate in the position. There are mm -hmm. always opportunities, but somebody has to give you that opportunity. I like that. And you have to run. That's great. I love the like creating a specific pathway for them, not just, you know, hey, where do you want to go? Have you thought about this? Have you considered this? Um, I think some of my my greatest opportunities have come when someone has said, I'm just having a casual conversation like we are, and someone has said, Have you ever thought about XYZ? And I'm like, No, why why didn't I? Or how didn't I? Or, you know, and I've followed a lot of those paths. So it's great that you're, you know, you were giving those suggestions and giving those options. Um what about a favorite experience? Do you have a memorable experience that you've created or um, maybe like you you kind of tuck someone under your wing and they just kind of did really well? Um, what was like, what was that like for you to experience in terms of, of creating that and seeing it go really well? Well, I can tell you as, as a collective group, what we did, you know, we're always providing, trying to provide the best customer service possible. And what I mean by customer service, it's not just a patient that's a customer. It's a coworker, it's a sales rep, it's a physician. And the hospital decided to challenge every department to promote good customer service. Okay. I decided to be very creative. And so what I did by that, I formed a little committee from each department, ultrasound, just to get a taste of a little bit everybody's environment. And decided to interview every employee and ask them the question, what is your definition of customer service? We recorded it. We put it on film or on, on screen, and then we went and we role played. We gave a list of things of what would be the perfect environment for that patient coming in for that CT. What would you do perfectly if that was your mother or your father or the administrator of the hospital? Walk me through what you would do and role play. I had my CT supervisor become the patient. Okay. He was on a stretcher. We wheeled him in. Through the wheeling in, there were bumps and bruises with the stretcher banging off the wall, uh, patient not covered. We, we created a scene, so this was the worst possible scenario you could imagine. We didn't talk to the patient. We didn't explain to the patient. We didn't give him a pillow. We did everything that, wow. And we took a step back and looked at that, and you know, those are some of the habits that we do. And then we reversed it. Then we gave them A1, care. We gave them a blanket, two pillows, we covered them, we held their hand, we talked to them very passionately, and we role played, and we, and like I said, we recorded it, edited it, we did it amongst the department. And I have to tell you, uh, Mary, it was an outstanding production. Everybody got involved, their spirits were lifted, they realized this is some of the things that we do. Little things like when you bring the stretcher and you're bumping the wall, you're not bringing the, the, the wheelchair together. You're not putting the footrest down. You're not covering them up. And so they saw, they took a step back and realized, wow, we could do better. This is what we should be doing. And it went off very, very well to the point where the CEO uh, had us presented at the department head meeting. It was so well uh, received. And everybody 
loved it because they were part of it. I think that's a great idea. I love how you created kind of that interdisciplinary um, team as well. So then they all work together. That's, well, that's excellent. I love that. I'm team. probably going to steal it's that. About the team. It's about the team. If you don't have buy-in from your staff, you don't have the respect, uh, you're not going to have success. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so speaking of that, that teamwork environment, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but it's something that I think it's important. Um, even myself at times have had struggle with the balance of, you know, when I create that leader member exchange, I want to create that buy-in. I want to create that openness. Um, you seem like you've done a really good job of that, that people could come to you. People could talk to you. Um, how do you set a personal boundary in something like that? As if, you know, you want to relate to them, you want to, you want to create this exchange, but how do you make sure you're maintaining that that boundary well again I have to set my own standards and, and what basically my routine every day when I walked into work after I opened up my office door put my keys down uh, didn't check my email what I first what I did first was round I rounded in each department said good morning to my staff talked about everything how was your day last day how's everything how are your kids get involved in their personal life a little bit of course you have to draw the line and um, Keep an open door policy. Open door policy is easy to say, uh, but just have conversations with your staff and one-on-one -on -one conversations so you're not in a distractive environment. Um, and just be present. Be Empower yourself to be part of their, their team. You just can't go into your office and sit there eight hours a day and expect that uh, things are going to get done. Know their job. Understand what they're doing. I often spend a few hours in the CT department just to see how they function, see what some of the obstacles were and ask them, what do you need? What could I help you with? Tell, show me where you're struggling with. So when I would observe this, I would be able to intake that very easily and then have a discussion with them privately and say, how can we make it better? Again, I don't have all the answers, but I need the resources of the staff to give me some insight. Um, I like that because I think that has a big implication on workplace attitudes. Um, did you see a difference in a department, like if you, you came from a department, you talked about your first job where you didn't feel like you had that, there was no leader member exchange when it came down to attitudes or the people that you work with. Um, did you see a big turnaround in attitudes and just the general feel of the department when you started with this pathway, this leader member exchange approach? Absolutely. You know, prior to me taking that position, at least one of the positions I had, you know, the, the previous director and not, not not knocking anybody, everybody has their own style. My style was completely different. They never saw a style like that. And they were in, they were like engaged. They saw that Elliot was engaging them, getting involved, ordering things. I would tell them, you know, they would say, you know, when are we going to get new chairs? Or when are we going to do this? I said, here's the catalog. Pick out a dozen chairs. I'll sign it. We'll get it done. I gave them the opportunity to make, make some decisions. Chairs, I need a new this, I need sponges, I need this. Buy it, buy it. What's the, what, it's a good business decision. So I, I let them make decisions, what they needed in their environment, within reason. If they needed a new CT, of course, they wouldn't be able to get it, but, but within reason. So that they're part of that um, the, the department. They just can't work nine to five and think that's it, they're gonna be productive. You've gotta create a good morale. Uh, and just meeting with them, uh, encouraging them, uh, and making sure that they're they're on the right track with with everybody's goal, not to be selfish about what their needs are. It was a department. Okay, how do you so how do you do that? But like still like you're pushing them to create their own opportunities, but yet you still want them to be you want them to be independent. So how do you teach someone like and I? I have this happen very often with students. So I'm in education. So it's almost you kind of you have to take the you know take the training wells off mentality. How do you encourage someone to be independent while still making sure that they have that underlying guidance from you? Well, so first of all, everybody is different. You can't use the same plan with everybody. Everybody's personality, feedback. You can tell five employees the same thing and they'll all interpret it differently. So you've got to be able to know your audience. You have to know what's going to make them work. What's going to make them not work? And interacting with them, asking them the questions, uh, letting them talk. Uh, the best way to communicate with them is just basically to listen and, and, and absorb what they're saying and know that what they say means a lot and try to encourage them with my experiences. Hey, tell them a story about, you know, back in the day when Elliot Silverman was an x-ray tech and I wanted to be a special procedure tech, this is what I decided to do and I needed to show my skills 
through my su supervisors. So that would be one of the techniques that I would use. Um, so let's move on to, I always like to give people an application. I don't want anyone to leave, you know, this knowledge base and not understand kind of a systematic approach. So what did that look for, like for you? What did that systematic approach look like in, in creating these pathways? Uh, well, I would meet with the staff. Okay. Um, supervisors all the way down to the subordinates, you know, underneath the transporters. Um, and, and again, each level would be different and just kind of create my ex expectations, goals and set and setting them and find and show them the plant, how to get there. Okay. We were just not going to do it by myself that I needed them to be part of it. Uh, and I would delegate a lot of the uh, potential employees that showed some decent leaderships to have them involved in it, have their coworkers lead their co have them lead their coworkers to this. It's not always a director that has to do it or can do it, but a lot of it is subordinates, okay. mid-level people, uh, even the lower people that weren't really interested in getting anywhere, give them the opportunity. Sometimes you get the best out of them by delegating responsibilities, make them feel worthy of why they're there. So when you talk about all these different levels, even if they have a, you know, there's a, a lower level all the way up, um, did you have the same conversation, the same experience with each person, or how did you how did you reproduce that? How did you make sure that um, each person got a similar experience? Uh, again, it would be based on individual uh, individuality. Okay. Uh, I knew most. I knew most of my staff. Uh, there wasn't m many things I didn't know about them. I knew how to communicate with them very well, uh, and tried to sometimes draw out uh, information that they maybe wouldn't want to give out. So each one would be different and then I'd handle it accordingly you know, based on their individual uh, preferences. Sometimes I would ask them, how do you, what makes you feel comfortable? You know, if you don't ask the question, you can't assume that that's what's going to work. Okay. So were there times that you didn't feel maybe a systematic approach, like a step-by-step -step approach wasn't right for that person or wasn't right for that individual? Absolutely. Sometimes it just doesn't work and you try, you try different techniques to do um, and you try to, look at, at trying to hitting the target, sometimes you fail. Sometimes you just can't accomplish what you want to accomplish. And that's okay. Uh, but for the most part, you know, you just have to be uh, persistent and, uh, and find different ways of, of creating that sense of pathway. Okay. Um, I want to switch the tables here a little bit and talk a little bit about job satisfaction. Um, I think sometimes, specifically in radiology, we don't see as much job satisfaction as I think we should. Um, so did you feel like giving people this empower improved that um, that job satisfaction or did it improve their their knowledge base? Did you often see people when you would bring them in and say, hey, have you thought about being a you know a CT um, tech or something like that? Did you feel like they got more satisfaction from their job or that they took that additional knowledge base on? I think it certainly helps uh, when you talk about, you know, in satisfaction within the department. I would like to promote from within. I let them clearly know that there are opportunities within. If there's no growing opportunities in an organization, you kind of stagnate. Morale goes down. Uh, you feel that like there's no end. Nobody is listening to you. Um, it's not only about the money necessarily, but it's moving along your uh, profession to do better, to always strive to do better. You know, I could have been an x-ray tech my whole life and probably be happy, but that wasn't my goal. I wanted to improve on an organization, be a leader, and I'd, I'd give them opportunities. One of the things that we often make a mistake in when you walk into a new job, often that happens, is that your supervisor is really not a true supervisor. They got promoted because they were the senior technologist there for 20 years, and poof, now you're a supervisor. It's more than just the title. Uh, you have to be able to communicate with people, gain their respect, and gave them opportunities to say, listen, if there is an opportunity, would you be interested in being my lead tech, my supervisor, my uh, uh, operations manager? These are the goals that you, you may want to look at to, to accomplish that. And if you're interested, I would love to help you along the way. Even if it means you don't get something in this organization, in this hospital, maybe there's an opportunity elsewhere. You can't hold people back on advancing. Yes, you'll lose them and in hopes you replace them with somebody equitable or better, but you can't stop uh, giving the opportunity to people to advance themselves. 
Um, so what did you see happen when that stagnation occurred? Because um, I, I mean, as, love, as much as I'd love to think, you know, we're, we're saving the world and everybody is going to advance and take these pathways. When did you see that happen? Why, what did you attribute to that when you saw someone remain stagnant? Or what did you say to them when they, if you said, hey, would you think about being a lead tech? And they said, no, I just don't think that's for me. What was your response? Well, listen, you can't force them. All you can do is just try to promote that. And, and certainly morale goes down when it becomes contagious. Uh, it's, it's not easy to keep the morale up all the time. There's so many different facets of the department. And, you know, people have feelings. And you you got to continuously have positive reinforcement to people. Um, like I said, we very rarely call engineering department up and saying, thank you very much, the temperature is perfect. We call up and say, you know what? It's too cold, it's too hot. We complain, we don't tell environment, hey, you know what? It's so clean in my department, thank you very much. We often call and say it's too dirty. We always complain. We put the negative spin on it versus the positive. And my my objectives were to make positive spins out of these little little occurrences that happen throughout the course of the day. So I like how you discussed the fact that maybe even if it wasn't a really great fit for your department or something, they were able to move on otherwise. Um, what advice would you give to someone about organizational fit? Um, like, should I hang in there? Should I move on? How long do I hang in there? Like, if, if I came to you and said, hey, Elliot, I'm, I don't know if I'm really happy at my job. I don't know if it's a great organizational fit to me. Um, what advice would you give me about that? My first question would be, are you happy? Okay. Are you happy coming to work? Do you want to go to work, not just for the money, but you enjoy what you do? You have a passion. Now, radiology departments are radiology departments. There are hundreds and thousands of radiology departments out there. But a lot of it has to do with the leadership, with the employees, with the organization, sometimes the equipment, the, the uh, environment that they're working under, and they have uh, the ability to make a change. If they're given that ability and they don't want to make a change or be empowered to make that change, then maybe it's not a good fit. I would not never say just throw your hands up and leave. I would try and make, make the best ability to make it work, uh, talk to me, talk to your peers, talk to your supervisor, see what would motivate you. What is it that would motivate you to get yourself in a different gear? And if you don't ask the questions, you're not going to get it. And some people just don't want to communicate that. Some people would just rather hide in the corner and just rot around, rot away. And, and those are the type of people that I wouldn't want on my team. I would want the people that are always looking to improve in the environment, in their self being, uh, and work towards that. It's all about working constantly to making yourself and, and environment better. If you don't have that desire, then I, there's only so much that you could do with that employee. Um, how about, I had, I had a mentor tell me one time, if I have an idea or if I have something that I wanna go to, so say for instance, if I'm not happy in my organization, if I have an idea, um, to do the legwork, make a presentation, the more information you can bring and present to that person, the more likely they are to say yes. Um, so would that be a good approach to someone who is unhappy in the organization that here's how I think we could possibly change things, um, here's how I see this working? Yeah, I mean, you want to get the feedback from the employee, whether they're happy or not happy, uh, but you want to ask the question and see if it's reasonable to think that that can improve. You know, the employees have more of an insight than we as leaders. They're in the trenches. Uh, and I learned that way back as a tech. You know, uh, they see things, do things like we don't always see and do. You know, we're, we're in the background answering to the radiologist administration. And as a, the, the ground level employee, they see things differently. Give them an opportunity. If you don't like something, why don't, why don't we change it? Here's the opportunity to change. Give me, how, give me a plan of how we're going to change it. Let them show you and tell you your you know, demonstration, show me, walk me through what your issues are, write them down, bring it up in a staff meeting, um, just communicate. Okay. I, I love that. I think it's great. I've used that technique several times and I usually have fairly good luck with it. Like, hey, I think we should change this. But I think as leaders, sometimes we become overwhelmed with, with feedback. I mean, if, my, if an employee comes to me and says, hey, I'm not happy. Okay, you're not happy about what? Then I have to try to create this, you know, this action plan to fix that. So I've just, I've thought that was a, a good approach. I just kind of want you to get your insight on that. Um, yeah. 
anything else specific that you want to share before we kind of move on to, on to our wrap up or anything you don't feel we've touched base on well one of the techniques that i did also i would first of all i would always set a staff meeting the last thursday of every month religiously okay. my requirements for every employee since they knew every third every last thursday of the month that they needed to attend a staff meeting they needed to attend at least 50 percent of the staff meetings which was six a year whether you work the night shift, day shift, you know when the staff meeting is, you know the times, there would be zero tolerance for that. If they attended the staff meeting and they were late, they would not allow it to be into the staff meeting. When I said the staff meeting was at nine o'clock, it's nine o'clock. They would not be able to enter the room. It's basically because of lack of respect from their coworkers and time that I asked them to be on time. Unless there are extenuating circumstances, that's understandable. So they were required to be part of this, the department by attending staff meetings. And in the staff meeting, the first thing I would do is I would go around the room, and I would probably have two staff meetings a day because of the change of shift, and ask everybody to share something positive with me. I don't want to hear about this or that negative. Just tell me something positive, preferably work-related. And they would go around the room, and each one would give me a minute or two of what a positive event was. So now you create a positive environment. Instead of somebody just complaining, there would be an opportunity for that, a very small one, but at least they'd have the ability to do that. And I would make it an exciting staff meeting because often staff meetings are very boring. You go over numbers and we have to do this, we have to cut staff, we have to, do, they don't want to hear that. You're not going to have them engaged. Um, I would tell them creatively or have a guest speaker from, from different departments to come in and speak about their department, whether it be nursing, operating room, administration. I would invite a guest speaker every month. So it's engaging. And uh, we would have a very positive environment. We'd last sometimes well over an hour. And obviously we compensate them for whatever. So we, we knew we had some structure uh, and we, got, we had them an ability, we gave them the ability to give me feedback. And I would have one of my staff members give a lecture on CT or MRI. And, get them to get a taste of all the departments so that everybody's engaged. The other thing I would do is sometimes the staff meetings don't apply to everybody. So where I would have section department meetings, CT only, ultrasound only, because their issues and problems may be different and we can't cover it all. So I would meet with my supervisor separately before every meeting, meet with them and then share that at the section meetings. We go into nuclear medicine and meet with them, go into CT and so down, Slowly but surely, we'd capture everyone in the department as a group and in a little uh, in the modalities that we had. That that sounds amazing. I like that. I like um, I like that you set a specific time. Um, was there anything specific about Thursdays, or you just were trying to create a cohesive date so everybody knew that? Thursday seemed to be the best day for everybody, and I, I said, okay. "What's the best day for you?" Okay. Thursday, fine. We'll vote on that Thursday, and okay. I would bring in a lunch if need be, you know, all the employee wants is recognition. They want positive recognition. When they show, when you see that you acknowledge their work, their good work, they're going to want to work better. Not for me, but for the patient. It's, it's for the one goal. You know, we, we work in an industry, it's a service industry, and we're one of the few industries out there that people don't want to come to get serviced. They go to a restaurant, they go to a hotel, they go on a vacation, they want to go there. But in radiology, in imaging, they don't want to be with us unless you're having a baby. That's the only positive <laughs> insight you have is wanting to go to a hospital, wanting to go to an imaging center is when you're having a baby. Other than that, the patient doesn't want to be there. They don't want to be with you. They want to get out. And you've got to make it a good experience for them. And you have to make it a good experience for yourself and your coworkers. So that's how I instill the, the, the view of, of all employees. I love that. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, so you talked about um, something positive. So what's something that you are the, the most grateful for, maybe professionally or personally? Like over your of your plethora of experience here, what's something you're most grateful for? Well, I'm grateful to a to get the opportunity to be in this industry uh, and giving the opportunities to move up the ladder, if you will. Of course, it took a lot of hard work, but it, it also took a lot of acknowledgement from other people that I worked with. They had to see me. 
They had to know that I had that drive, that passion. And so those people that acknowledged that um, gave me the opportunity to move up. They opened the door for me and it was up to me whether I want to succeed or not. Um, how about if you were going to give someone entry level? Let's say that you you found yourself, you know, you found that that student right out of high school, headed into radiology. Um, what advice would you share with them in terms of, you know, hey, I've been here, done this. This is the advice I have as a younger generation. Number one, Mary, would be attitude. Okay. If you do not have a good attitude, uh, you're probably not, not going to be successful. I can teach you how to do radiology. I can teach you how to do CT and MRI and all the other modalities and anything else, but I can't teach attitude. And it's very visible when you have a bad attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, it brings everybody else down. It stops you from being successful. And the other thing is you have to be accountable for your actions. Uh, you need to make sure the choices that you make, you're going to be accountable for. Uh, the other thing, believe it or not, I'm a very big stickler for being on time. If the employee is not on time, oh, you're going to hear it from me. Why? Because it's a lack of respect to your coworkers, to me, and more importantly, the patients. And not being on time tells me that you're not respectful to others. We're all late. We all have reasons, but we all, I've heard every excuse in the world. I've had an employee that lived literally across the street from the hospital. And I, you know, obviously I live in South Florida. We all drive to work. There's no public transportation. But for God's sakes, why are you late every day when you're walking across the street and it's 70 degrees, no rain, no snow, there's no traffic, and yet every day you are late? I don't understand when people are traveling 60 miles to get to work, they're on time, and you can't make it on time across the street. So I found that very humorous, and I've heard all the excuses. My alarm broke, this broke, and I, and I said, you know, you get three shots. You, it's like baseball, you get three strikes. The third, the fourth one, you're out. So, you know, there's nothing else I could do. You've made this choice. But you have to be on time, you have to be accountable, and you have to be a great attitude. Without an attitude, I think that's the number one uh, important uh, uh, skill that you have. Okay. And it's not uh, easy. You know, it, it, there's a lot of pressure amongst us, personal, professional, but you got to come to work with an attitude. We all have issues at home. We all have significant others and everything else. But you got to cross that line when you come to work and you punch in. You have to have that that attitude consistently. Um, yeah. When I was growing up, if you were if you were not ten minutes early, you were late. That was the rule. That's right. <clears throat> that was right. the rule that we had growing up. So I've always I've been a stickler about that too. Um, how you know, about I've never had as a director or a supervisor. I never had a exact time to be in. I, but I would always be in on time. My time would be seven o'clock in the morning. I didn't have to be in at seven. And many of my directors in the past that work, I saw them coming at eight, nine o'clock, casually walking in. I needed to be there first thing in the morning. And I needed to leave late. Uh, did I want to? No, but I felt it was a responsibility of mine to show good work habits. I got paid whether I got in, came in at seven or 10, but I made it a point to know that I'm going to be there every day at seven. And that was just me. I. Well, I also a big for that. Um, how did you change or transition an attitude? Um, I know there's times, there's days where I I can get going in the morning, I can get processing stuff, and I just I know I'm having a bad attitude. Like I'm I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I'm supposed to be attitude wise. I can I can self um, I can self reflect that I'm there. How do you transition out of something like that when you, it's it's a it's a crappy day and it's not a great day and I I don't really want to have a good attitude, but I know I have to. What did you use to get yourself back into that mindset? Um, that's a good question. It, it's really very difficult to do. You know, we, I've gone through some personal issues while I was a director and, and had to cross that line. And sometimes you just don't have 100% of your efforts. Um, you, you still have to have that attitude that it, it's going to always get better. Okay. Um, I typically don't worry about things I have no control over. That's been my philosophy for, for many, many years. It's been very successful for me. It's not easy to say that, but things I don't have control over, I don't worry about. If I lose my job tomorrow, unless I did something flagrant, I don't worry about it because I have no control over it. There are certain things in life you have no control over, so why worry about it? I worry about the things I do have control over, and that I can fix. And you know, you, you try not to. Uh, I've had, I've been very lucky to have better days and bad days. 
so I've been very lucky, but not everybody's like that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that because I I'm I'm also fortunate. I don't do as well with things that are not out of my control. I'm working on that, <laughs> but I don't I don't know if I've yet it's mastered not, that. It's it's not easy. It's totally not easy. It's a different mindset you have to have. You have to be disciplined, and mm -hmm. it's easier said than done. It's it's very difficult to do that. Um, how about a, a saying that you live by? Um, something that you just kind of always you keep in the back of your mind, or that it seems reoccurring to you. Good question. You don't have to be sick to get better. Okay, I like that. You don't have to be sick to get better. Okay, that kind of goes back to your stagnant and things like that. Hmm. It relates to everything in life. It really yeah. does relate to everything in life. That that's great. I that's that's my favorite part about doing these webinars is I get insight like that. I get information like that. It's absolutely fabulous. So and I share um, that with the people that I work with as well because you know um, you can always strive to be better. Don't don't settle for what you what you're doing right now. Always strive for something else. Always look for a goal. Always be positive. Never give up. I'm 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 a very very positive person. I try to share that with the people that I'm that that's around me, because negativity doesn't do anything for you. No, it really doesn't. And again, getting better, getting better. There's always a way to get better. To get better, whatever you do. I love that. Well, thank you so much for your insight. Um, well, definitely we can take take comments or questions that are about something you want uh, maybe Ella and I to discuss in the future or something that you have more uh, questions about a detailed approach that we talked about today. Um, you're welcome to leave those um, to us and we'll, we'll get back to you on that. Otherwise, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your, your knowledge and your tools and resources. It's absolutely, absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much. Mary, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity.